Uh, right, so, um, hi, I'm Angus. Uh, I should be clear up front, I work for Google, but not on anything at all to do with Android. So for the purposes of this talk, don't mention Google in this talk, that'll only confuse things. Just, um, I'm just a regular guy who happens to have some Android phones and like hacking on Android in my spare time. Uh, so I got, I've got a bunch of my phones here. So this one, I got a G1 two years ago um, for free. That's always nice. Uh, and started looking at it. It was quite interesting. Um, and I wanted to learn more about it. So I decided I'd uh, see how it worked under the hood. And I looked at how the C code ran. Um, the nice thing about Android is you get the full source code for it. So I looked at that and saw how they did things and, and learned from that. And thought I'd port a program to it. So I'm just waiting for this to start up here. It doesn't really matter. You can't see it anyway. Um, is that, uh, the, the oh, is there? I might pull out one of my other phones in. Uh, anyway, um, so I ported Scum VM to Android. And this is a better one. This is if it runs. There we go. Uh, start. Let me choose start. Go. There we go. There's. It's even sound. Um, so, Scum VM is quite a, a large C program. Luckily, there you go. You'll recognize it intro if you played Dead the Tentacle. Um, it is quite a large C++ program. Um, it's luckily designed for portability. It's already been ported to many, many platforms, so it's got quite good abstractions in there already in the code, so it was quite an easy project to port. It really wasn't that hard. Um, and I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I strongly suspect it was probably the first native app on the Android market because I did it before there was an NDK um, and there were no rules and it was all terrible and I've had to re-implement it since now that there are rules. Um, but I learned a lot along the way, so it's very interesting. So I thought I'd give a talk here about, for people who know how to write programs for Linux and kind of the, the delta that you need to know to be able to t uh, write a program for Android. Um, it's a little bit of a scatter talk. I'll just be lightly covering a whole lot of issues that could be entire talks in themselves. So if there are questions, you know, shout out and I can stop and talk more about any particular area. So in case you didn't know, Android is this OS. It's on some phones. Uh, it's a little different to a normal Linux desktop in that it assumes a single user. There's no idea of user logins and multiple users. Uh, it assumes touch screens, that sort of user interface. It doesn't have double clicking and tabs and those sorts of desktop GUI idioms. Um, it runs on top of the Linux kernel, which is nice. You get an awful lot of functionality, you know, MMAP, file API, networking, all these sorts of um, threading functionality. Uh, of, a, of a modern kernel. It uses a new libc called Bionic, which is based on one of the BSD libc's, I think. Uh, it's fairly simple and small. It was designed for... It was designed to keep GPL out of user space because that was scaring some of the phone manufacturers. Um, it is small. A very small runtime overhead, unlike glibc, which is quite large. It doesn't have things you don't care about on the phone, like locale support, um, wide characters. Uh, it has pthreads and threading from the beginning. There's none of this need to use the underscore r versions and things of various functions. They're, they're all provided by default in Bionic. Um, but it's, quite, it's still quite a small and simple libc, so some of the fancy features you might expect in glibc aren't there. Um, and most apps, all apps, as far as Android is concerned, are Java apps, um, or whatever the right legal definition is. I don't know what words I should be using in this conversation. Um, and they run on top of a Dalvik virtual machine. Um, so a few other weird differences. It doesn't follow the file system hierarchy standard. Most of the OS is in slash system which leads to a few amusing things like system bin sh. 
Um, this is done mostly to make upgrading the OS a bit easier. They just basically, the whole slash system tree is read-only. And when you do a, a firmware um, upgrade, they just replace that whole tree with a new version. Uh, the, there's some interesting kernel additions. Um, one of them is the out-of-memory handler. No apps in Android actually exit. They start up, they run, they hang around. You know, threads come and go in those processes. They just hang around. When it runs out of memory on Android, there's an out of memory, custom out of memory handler that goes up into a user space process and it says, right, we're out of memory, we have to kill something. And there's a defined list of priorities. Uh, the, the thing the user is currently looking at, the foreground application, is the very last thing to be killed. And you know, idle processes that aren't actually part of any running functionality at the moment are killed first, and as you'd expect, um, background tasks are killed, and then sort of, um, what are they called, foreground services, things like your, your music player, which might be in the background, but is something that the user is very much aware is still running, will be killed later, and then eventually the actual foreground app is killed as the, as the last choice. Um, there's a rather extensive IPC patch called iBinder, which is rather black magic to me. I really don't know much about it, but there's a talk later on today by Benno, um, which I'm hoping to learn more about it. And there's a few other patches, uh, a few other kernel additions like wake locks and things, which changes the power saving. It's just the way Android does power saving. It's uh, take a lock to keep the screen awake, release the lock when you know, you're prepared for the screen to go back to sleep, those sorts of things. Um, also, differently to a normal Linux system, Android tries to sandbox applications from each other. It assumes applications are fairly um, malicious and evil and need to be contained. So it gives each application its own user ID. And this is where most of the Android sandboxing comes from. So instead of protecting users from each other as a normal Linux multi-user system is, it's protecting apps from each other, but, but using the same mechanism. So then there's a bunch of permissions, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and some of these are implemented through normal um, Linux group IDs. So to be able to write to the SD card, you have to be in a particular group ID, and that's implemented just as you would on a normal Linux system. If you declare that you want to be able to write to the SD card, then you get granted that group ID when the package is installed. You're, you're put in that group. Um, and each application gets its own directory in this slash data slash data and the name of the package. Uh, and there's a few common directories in there, um, like a slash cache, uh, where when you run out of space, there's a cleaner that runs through and just deletes everything from every app slash cache directory. Um, and there's a slash lib where libraries automatically get unpacked into native libraries um, and a few other ones. But otherwise, that's your applications private directory and it can write whatever it wants in there. Um, and other applications can't even read that, again, via normal file system permissions. So it's a little different to a regular Linux system. Uh, and also, of course, there's no X windows, which makes it different again to the Mego platforms you've just seen. The way Android drawing works is most applications uh, render screens and they pass them off to a Surface Flinger service which just takes the screens and, and overlays them um, with alpha blending and various other effects and shows them to the user. So it's very, very simple compared to X-Windows. Um, it's reasonably efficient and clever. There's kind of a double buffering thing where you are rendering one frame while the Surface Flinger is, is using the other frame and then you switch. Um, and I don't really know the details of how GL works, but I presume it bypasses some of that to use the hardware acceleration, but um, no X windows is the point. Permissions. So Android apps uh, declare up front what permissions they use. If you've ever used Android, Android you've seen this. Um, they declare, I want to be able to write to the SD card. I want to be able to read your contacts. Um, and then you agree to that when you say, yes, OK, install the application. There's no interactive prompting of this application wants to be able to reformat your hard disk. Is that okay? There's none of that sort of stuff. Um, it's all declared up front. 
these are for, the important thing about this for this talk is that these are implemented in the OS. They're not implemented in the Java libraries or in the sort of some intermediate layer. So when we're writing native applications, we're bound by the exact same permissions. You can't do anything extra by writing a C program compared to what you could do in the Java land. You have the exact same uh, constraints put, put around your entire process. Um, there's a f People often think otherwise. There's a, lot, there's a fairly constant stream of questions on the Android NDK mailing lists about how oh, I want to write in native code so that I can, you know, do something outrageous that a normal app is not allowed to do. Um, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, in particular, you don't get root as an application, so you can't reconfigure networking. You can't do any of those things that require root privileges on a traditional kernel. Right, so Android really wants to think that everything is Java. So each application has these entry points. There's no main function that just gets invoked. When you're writing a normal Android application, you implement a Java class that inherits from some of these other ones, depending on what exactly you want. Activity is the most common one. And there's various callbacks in there. There's, you know, on start, on stop, uh, on touch event. And they get called when various things happen. And you put some code in between those parts, and that's your application. When we're writing a native application, we still have to let Android think that's what's going on. So I'll get a little bit to that later. Um, but they're the common classes. So you have an activity, which is one per, per screen. Typically, if your, scre if your application has multiple screens, if you have multiple activities, and you'll move between them quite frequently. Um, service is for background tasks. Uh, and there's an idea of foreground services, which are the ones that have a little colored icon up the top, and they're things like music, music players. Um, a little colored icon up the top. The user is well aware that this service is running. And then there's background services which are for things like um, syncing your contacts. They just happen in the background. If they happen to get out of memory kill, the user won't notice. You'll try again later, a little while later. Um, and then there's a mechanism called intents, which are used frequently all through Android. It's sort of a way of bundling up an event. You have a URI, a URL, describing some sort of data, and it's quite common to make up a URL scheme. You'll have some, you know, I don't do this, but I could have a scumvm URL scheme with scumvm colon slash slash the name of a save game or something like that. And then I would fire off that intent, and there'd be a program. You can register that you want to receive certain patterns, certain filters uh, of intents. So you can say, I want to get all of the scumvm colon intents. And, and then I'm going to understand them. I'm going to say, well, this means I should start up ScumVM with this save game already loaded and start running. Right? Uh, the advantage of doing that is that someone else could write, it's a little bit still in the ScumVM case, but in the photo case, you know, I want to take a photo. Someone else could write a different photo taking program. And they could register the same intent filters. And then when your application says, I'd like a photo, fire off that intent. It could run the normal photo app. It could run their custom photo app. It could present a menu to the user saying, there are several choices here. Which one would you like to do? And this is how all of that indirection happens in Android. It's done through intents. Um, one of the cases where this is used is broadcast receivers. So lots of events that happen on the phone. Uh, the, the power has been plugged in. The SD card has been removed. There's an incoming phone call. All these sorts of events um, fire off intents. So you can create a broadcast receiver and catch those broadcast intents in order to do things. That's just another common entry point for Android applications. Again, for our purposes in native code, we have to worry about things like processes a little bit more. Um, you have a, a process, and then each of these activities and, and broadcast receivers are usually new threads that are created within that process by the Android framework, by the common Java classes. Um, they're all forked off a common parent, but that's for implementation detail. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, really, though, you have one process per application. That's usually the way things work. And if you started forking, executing other processes, you'd 
it would work, but you start to confuse a, a few things like the out of memory handler and stuff. It doesn't quite know what to do. That's a rather unexpected thing to do on Android. Uh, and the general thing is, once your activity has, once on pause has been called, that means you're no longer the foreground application. So the user has pressed back or chosen some other application, or you've declared that the user is finished, they pressed a done button or something. Um, your on pause will be called. And then the other, the other callbacks on stop, on destroy, may not be killed. If the out of memory handler comes in, you could just be killed at any point. So the usual thing to do is to save all of your data, do whatever you're going to do that commits those changes in your on pause handler. So if you're writing a game or something, you want to save your files at that point. Um, don't rely on anything after that happening. So um, tools for developing, there's two. There's an SDK, the standard Android SDK, uh, which has all the Java environment, lots and lots and lots of documentation, examples, how to add Android apps. For our purposes as well, you'll also want the NDK, the Native Developer Kit, which has GCC tool chains, uh, GDB server. Um, you'll want both of these, and you'll probably want to be quite familiar with the SDK and how to write a normal Java application before you try and write a, a native application. So here's the way it works. We have to pretend we're a Java app. So Java has something called JNI, <clears throat> which Android supports quite well. And, and most of the framework classes are actually implemented using JNI. They're implemented in C++ with a very thin Java wrapper for uh, the compatibility. The, the public API is Java, but the implementation is almost always C or C++. Um, so we're going to compile our native library as a JNI library, which is just a shared library, libsomething.so. Um, we install it into the APK, the Android packages are just zip files. So you can install it using the zip command or you can use the APK builder um, tool that comes with the SDK. It has to go in this directory inside the APK, lib slash the ABI, which I'll mention in a few slides, and then your library. And when you install that package, those libraries get automatically extracted from the APK and put into data slash data package name slash lib and they go in there. Uh, and so that's in the path. So when you call system load library from Java, it knows to look in that directory to find the libraries, and it'll load it up, deal open it, and everything's happy. And then we invoke them from Java, and we're done. <clears throat> the, yeah, so the runtime to provided is very minimal. You get libc, bionic, libm. Um, you get zlib. Uh, for compression, you get a very tiny SDDC++, <clears throat> although with the latest NDK, release 5, there's a much greater improved one. You can use STL port or even try your luck with libstdc++ um, if that works for you. Before then, the, the provided C++ standard library was very minimal. It was really just stub holders. You also get liblog, which is for printf debugging. So there's a bunch of log macros there which write to the Android logs, and that's been my most useful and reliable way of debugging Android programs. Uh, the GDB is a little quirky and a little bit hard to get going, so you only use that in extreme cases. Uh, you get OpenGL, which is the only real way to draw from native code. And in Gingerbread, which is the most recent release that's now at Nexus S's, only came out, um, whatever, a few months ago. Um, there's a much greater set of libraries for Android applications, um, but they're... I haven't looked at it yet because not on enough phones. The, the problem with writing applications is that you, if you want lots of users, you need to look at the trailing edge of the versions, whereas the Android team guys get all excited about their new features and they're doing the, the leading edge, and you have to worry about the trailing edge of compatibility. Um, so yeah, you have to static link everything because everything, if you want libpng, if you want ffmpeg codex, if you want any of these things, you'll need to compile a library yourself. You need to statically link it into yours um, in order to get that extra code. There's a very, very minimal runtime environment. You'll find a lot of instructions out there on the internet talking about using various other libraries. Uh, if you see anything mentioned libcutils or a few other uh, libraries, these are internal Android libraries. They're the ones I used when I did my first port of ScumVM, 
when there was no official NDK and there were no rules about what was actually the compatible um, ABI, you don't want to use any of those. They do change subtly in ways that will crash your program uh, in the most minor of point releases on a phone. An example is the Xperia X10, uh, they did a security update, which for some reason involved changing the audio libraries. So ScumVM before worked just fine, ScumVM afterwards, uh, there was no sound. Um, the sound initialization failed. It could have been much worse, it could have crashed. Um, so you really, really can't use those internal libraries. They'll change at any point in ways that will hurt you. Defined ABIs, ARM, A, ARM e ABI is the most common one. That's the usual, that's what all these phones run. The newer phones have hardware floating point, which is V7A. Even the hardware floating point, we still pass uh, when calling functions, we still pass the use software floating point registers so that it's compatible with the pure software floating point code. Um, so it's not quite as fast as it might be. You can't assume extra things like Neon. Neon is the ARM um, kind of MMX instructions. You can't assume that. You, the advice is to test for it at runtime and provide fallback libraries and switch you know, to this version of your library or that version of your library, depending on what you discover is available in the processor, um, which is a little awkward. Um, and just as an example, you need these sorts of sets of flags. You end up learning your tool chain quite well. If you use the standard NDK, there's a set of, there's a compile environment in there which does all this work for you. So it's definitely the way to go if you're starting new. But if you're trying to port an existing code base like I was, and so you can't use this new make file system, you have to use the existing one, you start to ha uh, learn all about these flags and what's required. The good news is a lot of this is in GCC 4.5 now. So you can just grab GCC 4.5, compile for that target platform, and if you use minus M Android explicitly or implicitly by using that um, target triple, then you get most of those flags are implied, and that does most of the hard work for you. Um, you need, yeah, minus L GCC placement gets a little bit hairy. You want to avoid, you want to use the libgcc that came with your tool chain. Um, and not whatever might be on your particular Android platform you're using. So you want to be a little bit careful about linking in libgcc explicitly uh, in your line, whatever. That's, that's a, I can explain much more about it if someone cares. Um, I just wanted to cover quickly JNI. If you're new to JNI, it's not very hard to learn. There's lots of documentation around. Um, briefly, there's two styles. There's one where you have long symbols like this. Uh, and the Java virtual machine will look up, it'll convert the, the Java method and it'll look up that symbol in your library and go, oh, that's the one I meant to invoke and do that. And you can see that at the top there, there's the um, Java function and at the bottom, the C++ implementation of that Java function. The other style is where you explicitly register them. So you say um, you have a JNI onload function that's called as soon as you load your library. And in that function, you explicitly call register natives, which says this function goes with this symbol. This function is called with that symbol. This function, that symbol. Um, and there's pluses and minuses with both approaches. The Android guys prefer this latter one, but um, there's certainly reasons why you might not want that. Um, a common mistake, which I should mention, is C++ mangling. These symbols need to be uh, nice and visible to DLSIM. And if you're compiling a C++ program, you tend to end up with extra mangling in there depending on the prototype, which makes it very hard to see. So X turn C is the answer to you, the question you haven't asked yet, um, which fixes that up. Um, and that's pretty much it. There's a bunch of debugging tools available. ADB shell gets you a shell. ADB is a tool that comes with the SDK. You plug a USB cable in, ADB gives you commands on the phone so you can install things over the USB cable. You can get a shell. ADB logcat shows you the system log. These are the ones you'll use a lot. And you can use GDB server via the NDK GDB script, uh, which runs GDB server on the phone and then GDB on your uh, laptop. And you can look at symbols just as if it was a normal embedded development thing. And that's what I got. Um, so I've very lightly touched on a whole lot of things. If you have questions, come and ask me. I can talk about these things for quite a while. Each one of those slides could be a half hour talk going all the way down into the details. Well, we've got five minutes for questions before the next talk. So does anybody have any questions? So yeah. Library in there. 
you can copy it to somewhere else. Yes. So this exposes something out of your package and out of the sandbox. So theoretically, you could have two programs sharing the same library. You would have to have, so the library goes into the, your application specific directory. Um, so you would have to explicitly go and look for the library from another program. You wouldn't just find it by accident. Uh, and you have to be able to read it. It has normal file permissions limiting it to your user ID. So if you, you can do things like have a family of packages and if they're signed by the same developer key, you can make sure they all get the same user ID. There's uh, some extra things you can declare in the package metadata. And then you could go and find them and you could load someone else's libraries up. It's rather complicated. Um, yeah? Oh, I should be repeating questions, shouldn't I? Yeah, so this comment was, um, there's a copy of the library inside the compressed APK and there's a copy of the library uncompressed onto the file system. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and if you have large libraries, for example, ScumVM, this becomes quite a problem. So I ended up doing a whole custom unpacker and complicated things and breaking ScumVM up into separate plugin packages so you only have to install just the ones you want. They have to be M mapped. So you could possibly store them uncompressed in the APK and then do some hairy M map with an offset. Um, no, flash is getting bigger. I don't care. Anybody else? Yeah, the back. Yes, you can, but it's. Um, so you put the, the, can you target multiple platforms with one package? Yes, you can, but you have to put multiple libraries in the same package. So you have lib slash x86, my library, lib slash army ABI, my library, which can get very large very quickly. So it's obviously not the right thing to do going forward. Luckily at the moment, th there's only ARM ABI. There, there are no non-ARM Android devices, let's face it. So the only reason you'd want to do it now is if you had a hell-optimized codec and you really wanted the hardware floating point but you had to fall back to non-hardware floating point for older devices. Uh, and then typically you could isolate just your bit of code and it would be a small, smaller portion, a small, you know, strings library, codec library. Um, it's not great at the moment. I expect that to improve. Sometime they'll have to if they go to more architectures. But at the moment it's that fairly clumsy mechanism. Is NDK just C or C++? The NDK is a GCC toolchain, which has GCC and G++. You can compile anything. It could be Objective-C, it could be Fortran, so long as you can produce a JNI onload symbol in your library. Uh, the JNI functions uh, have C and C++ bindings, and they're similar but slightly different between the two calling styles. Um, Yeah, Go program would be interesting, uh, and quite possible. You just have to JNI, JNI bindings, and then the rest would just happen. Yeah. Last, Last question. Have you considered Clang and LLVM? The have I considered Clang and LLVM? Uh, I haven't done anything about it personally. Um, they would certainly be possible to use. You'd have to um, add the few. You'd have to add what the minus M Android does to those tool chains, which wouldn't be hard. There's nothing really specific in here. It's using the normal Linux GNU ABI um, target. So you could certainly do that. Uh, you might need a few more command line flags, um, but it's just, just native code. All right, well, thank yep. you, Angus. No worries.